In my recent videos in the Lines That Never Were series, I talked about reverse branching and I put forth in the interlining plan that I took straight from Van Schnookenragen and Uday Schultz. That has created a lot of commotions in the comments. Some saying that it is too crazy and others saying that it is good. But most of you started putting forth your plans to the interline. At first, I thought that it was just a few of you who had this one problem, but almost everyone in the comments had it. That is why I created this video, because I felt like many of you have no idea what deinterlining is and are unintentionally creating more interlining under the pretense of deinterlining. So what is reverse branching? Well, let's take a look at what branching is. Branching, in its most simplest form, is when a line splits into two and heads away from each other. The New York City subway system and the commuter rail system is built on this concept. Like, just take a look at any corner of the map and you will see lines splitting into two. Branching in a vacuum isn't bad, as branching is usually used when a line heads into the outer boroughs, but what makes New York City bad is reverse branching. Reverse branching is when a line splits into the city center, hence the name reverse branching. Multiple train lines in New York City do this. The ENF on Queens Boulevard, the 2 and 5 on White Plains and Nostrand, the D and N on 4th Avenue, and the B and Q on Brighton, and the F and G on Culver. And if you want to blame a specific subway operator for this, then sorry, every part of the subway is built on reverse branching, so no specific network has your hands clean. Even lines that are deinterlined and run on their own tracks have a history of being entangled with other lines. The most famous deinterlined line is the 7, or the Flushing Line. Yet from 1917 to 1949, it was famously reverse branched under joint operation, and had services going to Times Square, Coney Island, Brighton Beach, and South Ferry. And don't worry, the city still likes reverse branching. The current 2nd Avenue subway plans to also feature reverse branching, just showing how deep reverse branching runs in New York City. So what is the problem with reverse branching? As you said, the system is chock full of them and it seems to run just fine. Well, the problem with reverse branching is that by branching into the city center, you are cutting capacity in a city center by half. But the city center is the part of the city where it is the most dense, as it is full of jobs, entertainment, and apartment buildings. So it needs to have the most capacity. Do you see the problem? By reverse branching, you are cutting capacity in the place where you need to have the most capacity, which is the city center. At least when you branch out into the outer boroughs, there are less people out there which means that the reduced service that comes with branching is usually justified. This is what the interlining solves. Ending reverse branching. Because the end goal of the interlining is to increase capacity and minimize delays. By having one service, and yes, I am including branches that go out of the city center on each pair of tracks. Reverse branching does the opposite of that, so that needs to go. So by proposing the E and F trains running via 53rd Street, you're effectively cutting capacity on the I and D 6 and 8th Avenue lines because that is a reverse branch. By proposing the M and R trains running via 63rd Street, you are effectively cutting capacity because that is also a reverse branch. By keeping the 2 and 5 on White Plains, you are cutting capacity. But I know what you're saying. Hey. The E combines with the C in the city center. The F combines with the N in the city center. The 2 combines with the 3, and the 5 combines with the 4. So the capacity decrease isn't that bad, am I right? First of all, that is interlining, or having two different services running on the same track. And I thought you were the interlining, or doing the opposite. And second, let's take a look at some numbers, shall we? The C and E combined run at 23 trains per hour. The F and M combined runs at 23 trains per hour. The R and W runs at around 20 trains per hour, and the 4 and 5 runs at 24 trains per hour. 
the maximum capacity if the interlined and with zero delays on most tracks is 30 trains per hour with some tracks able to handle 33 trains per hour or more. This means that reverse branching, even with another service combined with them later on, is scanning riders out of 25 to 30% of capacity. Why is that? Well, let's take an example. The E and M merge at 5th Avenue, 53rd Street. The M branches off from the E and merges with the F, showing the reverse branch then combined phenomenon of the New York City subway. Under a perfect system, the E, F, and M trains all run at 15 trains per hour, and trains maintain perfect harmony. Whenever an E train leaves 5th Avenue 53rd Street, the F leaves 57th Street and pass under each other. Then an M train after the E emerges onto the F train tracks. But since the F train runs at 15 trains per hour, the next F isn't there. So there are no delays, and everyone is happy. And you could probably repeat this cycle for probably the next 2 or 3 hours until rush hour dies down. Balanced, as all things should be. The problem with that is that not all trains are created equal. The E is way more heavily used than the M. This means that the E needs more train capacity than the M. And since the M merges with the F, this means that any adjustments to the E would impact the F as well too, so that you aren't creating any delays. When you have both the E and F run at different frequencies, you will eventually have a time where delays would occur. It is called math, or more specifically, the least common multiple. The problem with service adjustments to this junction is that this junction isn't a closed system. The F also combines with more lines, so you would have to adjust those lines too, and hope that those lines aren't also heavily used. For the F, you get lucky, because the G isn't really heavily used, and if the G ever sees more ridership, then the F can be diverted onto the express tracks on the IND Culver line, while the Queens Boulevard line is undergoing CPTC to absorb that extra service. But again, not all lines have express tracks or lightly used services that you can easily adjust. When the 5 branches off from the 4 and onto the 2 at either Nostrand or White Plains, you hit a wall. Because both services see very high ridership. So any adjustments to service would be very unpopular. You either reduce the 2 and give the 5 more capacity, which isn't going to fly with 2 train riders, or vice versa. So to accommodate these delays, the MTA just reduces service. It makes it easier to schedule and time trains because fewer trains on the tracks mean fewer opportunities for delays. This is why you're getting scammed out of capacity when you're proposed at the E and F via 53rd or any reverse branching system. But when you de-interline, you remove reverse branching in interlining, which means that every line is a closed system. This makes it easier to time trains, because you would only need to time two trains, not three or four. So if one branch ends up being more used than the other, service can be adjusted accordingly, without rippling throughout the entire system. All of this goes to show that reverse branching is horrible. And the combining system that I usually see from transit enthusiasts isn't really effective at adding service to respond to growing ridership. But I hear the comments right now. People love their 1C rides, and we must put the ENF on 53rd. My response to that will take a page out of Elon Levy's book. What 1C ride? Your famed 1C ride doesn't exist in the majority of the system. Let's take the IND Queens Boulevard line, for example. Most of the ridership comes from local stations, and their 1C ride options involve the IND 6th Avenue line or the BMT Broadway line. Sounds good. Until you realize that both lines are like a block apart in the city center, where most people are going. Like the entire argument that reverse branching or interlining advocates make is the fact that one can go to different places in the city center from where they are. But that argument gets undermined real quick when both reverse branches are like less than 0.2 miles away from each other. Only the express stations are the ones that get actual choice between the IND 6th, IND 8th, 
and BMT Broadway lines. But that is only limited to a minority of people lucky to live near an express station. The rest have to deal with the negatives of reverse branching and interlining, horrible service, delays, and slowdowns because some train in the 18th alphabet crossed in front of us. This is what millions of New Yorkers face, no one-seat ride and the drawbacks of a heavily reverse branch system. Even White Plains, which has a heavy preference for reverse branching to Lexington, doesn't have real choice. Only three stations on White Plains during rush hour, Grand Concourse, 3rd Avenue, 149th Street, and East 180th Street, get real choice between the two and five. And no, the five north of East 180th Street doesn't count, because that arrives like every 15 minutes, which makes it unreliable. The rest, well, you have to transfer, or walk extra on Southern Boulevard to catch the six. This is why I proposed a plan under the IND 76th Street Tunnel video. IND 8th Avenue trains run exclusively on the express tracks of QBL, IND 6th Avenue trains run exclusively on the local tracks of QBL, and the BMT Broadway trains get booted off the line to serve Astoria. There is no reverse branching and recombining with other routes, and trains stay together in the city center. But to make this work, an info station on Northern Boulevard on the IND 63rd Street line would have to be built for a transfer at Queens Plaza. And before anyone yells in the comments about how infeasible it is, just know that that station was included in the 1968 program for action, before it got cut because of budget constraints. Of course there are some places where reverse branching might work better. Queenslink is one example for all the reasons on screen. Feel free to pause and read them out. And if you want to hear the extended version, I linked our video, Queenslink v Queensway, in the description box below. The BMT Jamaica line to the IND 6th Avenue line is another, because the BMT Jamaica line is restricted to 24 trains per hour due to the structural integrity of the Williamsburg Bridge. Due to this capacity restriction, this gives the J and M trains more wiggle room to switch onto their respective tracks without delaying one another. Even when something goes wrong on the J, the M would just get rerouted on the Culver Express tracks and would short turn at King's Highway. All of the other reverse branching would need to end, and yes, I am including White Plains, though that would be the last project because of how complex it is. What I learned about deinterlining the IRT is that it is an all or nothing response. You have to deinterline everything to get all of those capacity increases. Since Lexington is a heavily used service, every train counts, which means anything that can cause delays need to go. 149th Street Grand Concourse, gone. Rogers, gone. Flatbush Avenue, gone. 142nd Street, gone. Of course, the 2nd Avenue subway exists, but it is laughably short, and it will be another 7 years at the earliest that Phase 2 gets built. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the 2nd Avenue subway is reverse branched, so planning might be needed to end the reverse branching of the 2nd Avenue subway, which will take time. So in the meantime, deinterline and get those capacity boosts now. Deinterlining can make a difference because think the interlining as a cheat code that gives you a 33% boost in capacity for a tiny fraction of what it costs to build a new subway line. And of course, I know that some deinterlining projects could get pretty complex, like deinterlining White Plains, because the Jerome Avenue platforms are island platforms and widening staircases would probably require some serious shutdowns. But that is way simpler from building a new subway line from scratch. If done correctly, meaning very little reverse branching, can serve as a nice temporary solution while we build the grand new subway lines that we desire. Anyway, this marks the end of this video. I hope that this video makes you revisit your deinterlining plans because chances are there would be some reverse branching that you may want to avoid. Redraw those lines, and I'll see you in the next video.